may be seated. As we were thinking about our worship songs and talking about uh, the men and women that have served our country, that have lost their lives on behalf of our country, and we want to honor them. It says here on May 25th, we are going to observe a day called Memorial Day. Yeah, good to see you. It is marked by parades, speeches, flags, flowers, and places flowers on the grave of many servicemen. It was first observed on May 30th, 1868, for the purpose of decorating the graves of the Civil War dead. Now it remembers all those who have died in wars our nations have fought. I think as well, we need to remember those men and women that are in the fight for Jesus Christ. Although the country needs men and women that will serve them, our Lord's sacrifice demands men and women to be in his work, in his warfare, a soldier of Jesus Christ. We truly honor the men and women that wear that military uniform. It is so humbling when I stand before a casket of a military man and that flag is draped. That coffin is draped with that flag. It brings tears to your eyes as those men take that flag off that coffin and they fold that flag up and they kneel down and they give that flag to the lone survivor. And there's not a more awesome display of honor that our military men have given to those that have fallen, to those that have lost their life. The saddens, because of that respect, we want to take that same respect and we want to honor those men and those women that have served our Lord faithfully. It was a beautiful sight that I saw a man that had been pastoring for years and he passed away. And he didn't serve in the military, but upon his coffin was draped the Christian flag because he thought and he knew that he was in a war. He was in a war that was not just seen with physical issues. It was a spiritual war fought on many different fronts, many different ways. And he was faithful. So Paul here in 2 Timothy chapter 2 is talking to a young man. He's talking to a young man by the name of Timothy. And Timothy just took this church in Ephesus. And Timothy was a timid, shy young man. And Paul was the, the leader. He was his, his mentor. And, and he heard that Paul heard that Timothy was having some issues within the church. And there was some strong rebellion going on in the church. And there was a few men and women that uh, they just caused havoc within the church. So Paul was writing Timothy in this book, in First and Second Timothy, of, of how to pastor the church and how to deal with some of those issues and how to confront those problems and how to stay faithful to God and in the doctrine of the Word of God. And he gives us some analogies in this scripture that I believe that we can take as, as believers of Jesus Christ and understand that we are in a warfare. We are in a battle. We are soldiers for Jesus Christ. Many times when people give their life to Jesus and they say, I want to go to heaven, but we really need to let them know that it's not as easy as giving my life to Christ. As soon as you give your life to Christ, you are in war. As soon as you give your life to Christ, your soul destiny is heaven, but the battle is right in front of you. And that battle cannot be seen with just mere eyes. That battle is a supernatural battle. And that battle is with an enemy that wants to destroy every part of your life. So often, we walk through this life oblivious of what truly is taking place. That's why, that's why Paul is given this letter. Timothy is opening this letter and he's reading this letter and he's having all these issues within his life. He's having all these issues within the church and Paul is just trying to say, I want to encourage you. I want you to know that you have the ability. I want you to know that what you're fighting for is worth it. He starts in verse 1 of chapter 2, and he says this, You therefore, my son, my son. It's a term of endearment. He said, Paul's saying, I, I've, I've taught you some things. I, 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 I've tried to share with you what you need to do. He said, my son, I hold you as my dear son. I care for you. I care for what you're going through. 
He said, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Now, it's, it's not like a dad saying, suck it up. Quit your crying, I'll give you something to cry about. Ain't dad ever tell you that one? He didn't say that. He said, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. That grace, that grace that is in Christ Jesus, that grace that saved you, that grace that's gonna give you power, that's going to move you into what I have asked you to do. It is a grace that's a transforming grace. It's a grace that is continual. It's, a, it's an active grace within our life. In 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all of our unrighteousness. And that is given to the believers. Our salvation is given. Once we have given our life to Christ, he has forgiven us past, present, and future. But grace is a continual act. We are all sinners. We all need Christ's grace. And be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. He's saying, Timotheus, you can't do this on your own. If you try to build the church, if you try to stand up for Christ, if you try to do your thing, you will fail because you have no power. Your power, your enlistment into Christ's army is about Jesus, and we need to be in him. He needs to be the commander of your life. And it says this, and the things that you have heard from me among others among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. He's saying, listen, Paul saying, Timothy, listen, the things I have taught you, I've mentored you, I need you to, to find faithful men, and I need you to teach what I have taught you to teach them so they can share with others. You need to build an army you need to build people that will watch your back. You need to build people that will understand the battle. Don't go into this battle by yourself. Don't try to fight all by yourself because you cannot do it. He said, the things I have taught you, go find faithful men and teach them that they can teach others. It doesn't stop with you. It has to go on. And then in verse three it says, you therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. You must endure hardship. In other words, he's not saying um, you might have some troubles. He's saying it's going to happen. You are going to have to fight. It's gonna to be tough. And he gives us four parallels here. The first thing he says, teach. You need to teach. You need, you need to be aware. And I remember the things that we teach, the things that we learn. While we give out, we retain. When I, when I study and I, and I learn the things that I teach, the things that I share, I can retain and I, and I understand. But when I read something and it just goes into my mind, but it doesn't come out of my mouth, I do not teach, I soon forget so what we must do is the things that we learn, the things that we understand, we have to give it out. We have to share. We have to talk. What we know, we have to give out. Find faithful men and teach the things that I have taught you. Share your life. Share your knowledge. After we teach, he says, then we need to be a soldier, a soldier for Jesus Christ, that we will endure hardship. We will have the enemy in our face. And then he talks about the athlete. He says, the athlete, we have to train our bodies. We have to be prepared for what we're going to do. And the last one he talks about, a farmer, planting the seed and preparing the crops. But we want to take the second one, the soldier. What is a soldier? What is a soldier all about? And use the parallel between being a soldier for the United States of America and we want to honor them. But we also want to be a parallel to be a soldier of Jesus Christ. A volunteer into an army that is very difficult. The enemy is very hard. The enemy hates you. The enemy wants to deceive you. And here's what you have to do. You have to be a follower. 
The first thing, you cannot be enlisted into the army of God unless you are a follower of Jesus Christ. In Mark chapter 8, verse 34, when he, had got, when he had called the people to himself with his disciples also, he said to them, whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Follow me. To be a disciple is to be a follower, a learner, to be one that wants to do the things of Christ if we want to really have a relationship with God, if we want to be enlisted into his service, we must be a follower of Christ. We have to know what he's talking about. No one can be a good soldier until you first understand who you are following. We are his ambassadors. We do speak for him. And when we have the word of God in our hearts and we want to follow him, when we follow him, when we listen to him, when we learn about him, we not only will follow, but we will do our passionate thing within our heart and we will serve the person of Jesus Christ. See, the church, the body of Christ, is a group of volunteers. Nobody made you come to church. Nobody forced you to get saved. You gave your life to Christ because you understood their need of Jesus. And when we talk about the church being the mightiest, most powerful volunteer organization on the planet, it's because we have a passion and we understand what Christ has done. So we serve him because we know that we can't do what he can do. Deny himself and take up his cross and follow him. In this church, what we must do is we must take up the cross and we must follow him. We have to have the power of grace within our life. We don't want to just be good. We don't want to just have doctrine. We just don't want to have ministry. We want God's power. If we as the body of Christ had the power of God that can give out that grace, that understands by grace are you saved, not as yourself, it is the gift of God. And we share that in our personal lives, in our corporate life. If we could just grab the power that I have it's from Jesus. It's in Christ. It's not in me. It's not in the facilities. The power that we have is in Christ because of what Jesus Christ has done on the cross. He shed his blood. He died. And he died for us as an individual. And when we give our hearts and our lives and we understand that I can't get to God without going through the cross. And the blood that he shed was to cleanse me of my sin, to redeem me to God. That is when I have power. That is when I go do work. That's when I serve. I understand I am not doing this on my own. I am doing this for Christ. Not only he's a follower, but he's a fighter. He is trained and taught the things of warfare. The Bible tells us to fight the good fight of faith. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay a hold on eternal life so that which we were also called and have confessed the confession in the presence of many witnesses. Fight the good fight. The verb fight is a present tense suggesting not letting up. It's imperative mode that when you quit fighting, you will lose. When you quit moving forward, you will lose ground. We must, even in our military, we see in our country, when we back away, other things will take over. And in our spiritual life, in our fighting for Christ, when we do not fight, when we do not stand up for Christ, it is very simply, things will creep in. Things will take its place. What we do not put as a priority, somebody else will take over in our life. And Satan wants to do that more than anything else. We must be a fighter. We must understand that we have to be dedicated, determined, and driven. Dedicated. I am dedicated to honor God. He is the commander in chief of my life. I need to be determined. I need to be determined not to be deterred. To stand firm. To love and driven. You know, the response to military is awesome. 
I love watching old men that have served our country. I love hearing their stories. I love hearing them talk about things that I have never even seen. Joe Garcia is our maintenance guy here at the church, and uh, Joe and I talk every once in a while, and he tells me stories about uh, his service and bullets flying and things that he has to do, and I'm thinking, that, wow, it, it's stuff that I could only dream of and think about, and I remember talking to my dad about some stories of, of military service, and, and uh, I've, I'm just in awe of them. Now, think about them dying. Now, I think about Joe dying a lot, but I think about the men that have passed on, you know, their service and their love that they have for their country and the respect that sometimes they do not get. And I found this video last night as I was just thinking about putting some application to the sermon about being a fighter, just being a common soldier, not being a general, not being a major leader, but somebody that has just served. Somebody that said goodbye to their family and went off to war. Did their duty. And they came back a common man. Lived their life and passed off the sea. I've been to so many funerals of old men and old ladies that have outlived their people. Do a graveside and five, 10, 15 people are at the graveside. And I'm thinking, if he would have died in his prime, the place would have been packed. But so often it's so easy that people just be common. And I think not only in our, in our countrymen, in our servicemen, we wanna tie that in to also the believers of Jesus Christ. Those that are common. Those that just do what they need to do because they have a passion for Christ. They are determined. We need to thank them for what they have done. But this video brought tears to my eyes because we need to say thank you. We need to say thank you to the men and thank you to the women that are the ones that gave us the freedom to stand up and communicate that Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins. These are the men and these are the women that we have to say thank you. Oh, they may just blend into the crowd. Another common man may have just passed away. The only people that will know about it will be maybe the wife or maybe the kids or maybe the grandkids. And sometimes it's too late. It's too late to say thank you after they have passed on. So let's look for those common men, those common women, on this day, on this Memorial Day weekend, and honor the men and the women that have not only served our country, but have also served our Lord. Let's watch this video.
And then at least let's give him homage at the end of his days. Perhaps just a simple headline in the paper that would say, Our country is in mourning. When we think about a soldier, the training, the equipping, the boot camp that they go through. When they go into battle, the commander in chief, and those in charge, they say he is battle ready. He has gone through his training, he's equipped. Whatever his specialty is, he is ready to go into battle. It's a soldier. But let's talk about the church. Let's talk about a soldier of Jesus Christ. So often we give our life to Christ and so often we are enlisted into the army that Christ has died for. And we go into this battle with our blinders on. Thinking that our security is in Christ and Satan is of no influence. Either we think Satan is all powerful or that Satan does not exist but we have to know that Satan is here to destroy you. And the battle that we are in is not about people we see. The battle we are in is about spiritual principalities, about things that we do not understand. He has to be familiar, and he has to be familiar with the strategies of the enemy. The strategies of the enemy, of the good soldier of Jesus Christ, he wants to destroy you. He wants you to be destroyed, ruined. Your testimony to be sacrificed. He wants to sneak in and trip and snare you so you have no effect. He wants to laugh and ridicule. He wants you to think that the word of God is not valuable. He wants you to think that God's word is out of date. He wants you to not even care about the body of Christ or that the power of God. He wants you to think that you can do this on your own. And if we do not believe that, we can watch people after people after people that have given their life to Christ. But because of issues that have taken place, they said, I forgot God. I don't like the church. I tried the God thing. And they are casualties of war. But God loves them. God will never leave them. There is nothing that can se separate our love from God and God's love to us. But Satan, oh, he wants you to think that it's nothing. He wants you to think that, pover that popularity and position and finance is more important than our spiritual condition for Christ. He wants you to think that God doesn't listen to your prayers. He wants you to think that it's a waste of time and it's a waste of resources to empower God's work. You can have something bigger. You can have something better. The scheme of Satan is to destroy the evidence of the power of God upon the planet. Did Jesus really exist? Was the blood of Jesus really a sacrifice? Did God actually do what the Word of God said? I don't think so. And if we believe the lie, we are accepting the deception of Satan. We're the body of Christ. We're the soldiers of Jesus Christ. What we must do is we must understand how Satan works and what I need to do in order to protect the very temple that God has given to me. We need to be familiar with the strategies of the enemy. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11. Let Satan should take advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his schemes. We have to understand how he works. I don't believe we should see Satan behind every corner and every issue that takes place that Satan is in charge of, but we as believers in Jesus Christ, we have to understand that he doesn't like us, that he hated Jesus, and he wanted Jesus gone, and now we are followers of Christ Second, he is familiar with the skills concerning his weaponry. You know, it wouldn't be fair, just like Paul was trying to talk to Timothy. He didn't say, be strong. He didn't say, suck up and get it done. 
He said, be strong in the grace and the power of Jesus Christ. So when somebody says you have to be aware of something, we have to give them the tools in order to be aware of how to do certain things. So listen to this in Ephesians chapter 6. It says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and against powers, against the rulers of this darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having your shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, and with it will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the, sword of, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication, and the Spirit being watchful to this, and all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. He said, dude, it's a battle. And God has given to you the ability, the life, that you can stand against the principalities and darkness. Don't give your life to Christ and accept it and think it's all going to be peaches and cream. Because it is not. It is going to be a battle. The addictions that you face, the problems that you have, Satan wants to manifest it to be overwhelming for you. And God wants to give you the peace and understanding that in the power of God, you can defeat the deceptions and the lies of Satan. And the third thing he says, he is familiar with the shadows of his friends. Just like Paul told Timothy, teach other men that they may teach others. He's saying, you need an army. You need people that you can go into war with. You need people that will pray for you, that will encourage you, that will help you. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. In other words, when it gets tough, when the battle is on, you need to have people around you and if we're going to be a soldier, we need to understand that we need our friends. And we need other soldiers to stand back to back, face to face, and to fight with us, aware that Satan is trying to destroy you. But I can see this. I can see, and I can help, and I can encourage. And the last thing is he is faithful. Endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Be strong in the grace. The expression is to take one's share of rough treatment, to suffer or endure affliction together. And it actually means to suffer hardship in the company with others. A good soldier is always, always serving and helping others. We need to be faithful. In John chapter 16, verse 33, these things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. I have overcome the world. Be of good cheer. The battle's going to be tough. There are going to be people that fall on the wayside. Just like the soldiers of our military, the common men that have lived their life, we need to say thank you. But in our spiritual realm, in our church, we need to say thanks. We need to say thanks to the common man. We say thanks to the nursery workers, children's workers, the band, the parking lot attendants, those that are just serving Jesus today. Those that have sacrificed so the church could exist. Those that have built, those that have shared their faith, we need to say thank you. We need to say thank you because we can't do this without you. This is not just for Sunday. Church is a life. It is a life that we are all called to. A good soldier of Jesus Christ has its purpose. I found this and it's adapted from another poem. I am a soldier and here I stand. I'm a soldier, a prayer warrior, 
of the army of my God. The Lord Jesus Christ is my commanding officer. The Holy Bible is my code of conduct. Faith, prayer, and the word of God are my weapons of warfare. I have been taught by the Holy Spirit, trained by experience, and tried by adversity, and tested by fire. I am a volunteer in this army. I am enlisted for eternity. I will either retire or die in this army, but I will not get out or sell out. I am faithful, capable, and dependable. If my God needs me, I am there. I am a soldier. I am not a baby. I do not need to be pampered, petted, pumped up, picked up, or petted. No one has to call me, write me, visit me, entice me, or lure me. No one has to send me flowers, gifts, food, cards, candy, or give me a handout. I do not need to be cuddled, cared for, or catered to. I am committed. I cannot have my feelings hurt bad enough and turn me around. I cannot be discouraged enough to turn me aside. I cannot lose enough to make me quit. When Jesus called me into this army, I had nothing. If we are ending with nothing, I will still come out even. I will win. My God will supply my needs. I am more than a conqueror. I have always triumphed. I can do all things through Christ. Devil cannot defeat me. People cannot delusion me. Weather cannot beat me. Sickness cannot stop me. Battles cannot beat me. Money cannot buy me. Governance cannot silence me. And hell cannot handle me. Even death cannot destroy me. I am a soldier, a prayer warrior in the army of God. I will not give up and I will never turn around. I'm committed. I'm committed to be a soldier. I may not wear the dress blues of Paul Peck, but what I wear, I wear the power of grace. I wear a stamp that says upon my life, I am forgiven. I wear the power of God that says he has a purpose. When we can live our life by grace, understanding I have been forgiven. When we understand the past that I've had is over. God has forgiven me. I am not bound to my past, but the power for the future is in Jesus. I do not have to hold my head down in shame. I don't have to ask people to forgive me of what I have done. My sins are under the blood of Jesus, and I can stand in that grace. That's what my power is. My power is I can serve you, not because of who I am and not because of what I have done. I can serve you because God's calling upon our life is to serve, is to love, is to encourage. We, the body of Christ, we have the greatest power, and that power is wrapped up in Jesus. And Jesus, the one that died on the cross, Jesus, the one that saved you, Jesus, the one that wants to empower you. So what do we do? We take our life, our struggles, our fears, our anxieties, our passions, and we say, Lord, I need to be strong. And I need to be strong because of what you've done for me. I need you to take over my life. I enlisted in your service, but I've never been trained for the service. I have been beat up, I've been broken, and I have been bruised. I've wanted to quit, but you would not let me quit. I need to be a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And being a good soldier of Jesus Christ, I know I'm going to endure. I know there's gonna be fights. I know there's gonna be problems. But I know the last day as a common man, when I close my eyes and I take my last breath, I get to see you. I get to see the faith, the faith of my Father. I get to see the forgiveness of my Lord face to face. I get to see the commander that I have fought for, that I love. That's what we're supposed to do. Church, we're at war. We're not here just to sing songs. We're not here to read the Bible. We're here to fight. 
We're here to stand up against the enemy of God that wants us to do one thing, just sit, sour, and be complacent. And if I can get the church to be happy, if I can get the church to have dissension, I get the church to have no power, the scheme of the devil wins. If I can get the church to fight amongst themselves, they won't even recognize who the enemy is. We have to be aware. The enemy that we're fighting is Satan. The problem that we have is complacency. The hope that we have is forgiveness and the power that God has given to us that we can do his work. Be a good soldier of Jesus Christ. It doesn't happen on Sundays. It happens every day of the week. Lord, I need you to empower me to do what you've asked me to do. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Father, Lord, we need you and we thank you. We thank you that you've called us to be a good soldier, to be a noble man, to be a faith man. I pray, Lord, that our church, starting with one, going through the entire congregation, will ask, Lord, what can I do to be faithful to you, to endure those hardships, to be a good soldier, to be ready and willing and faithful every day to honor you. We ask you for that in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Pastor Al.